capitalism, all of the gains in automation, it goes to the owner class. All you have to do is have everyone be an owner, and now suddenly, any gain in automation is a gain for everybody. If you grow just one thing, it may not grow as well as if it grows with another thing. A good example of that is called the, the Three Sisters Method of Farming. There is definitely multi-apartment buildings or multi-families that do do a passive A hundred million dollars that they gave to Joe Rogan that they would kind of be out if they breach contract. Is that a bigger number? Or is two billion a bigger number? <laughs> It's a tough one. I know. Really hard. And maybe, maybe yes. comparing numbers is not uh, Jeremy Strong. Gotta go kill a Jenny. I still don't think you should kill her. I don't think it's a good idea. It's a ghost, dude. Welcome back, everybody, to Bread Theory. Tonight, we're going to be continuing on with our series on a people's history of the United States. We are at Chapter Six, which is about the uh, um, about women's contributions to early America. And this is uh, part one of, of the chapter, so we're starting a fresh chapter this week. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to share it to a couple more places here. So that everyone gets the, the notice that we've gone live, finally. I was waiting to see if anyone was going to join, but I, I guess probably Trish is having connectivity issues, unfortunately. But who knows, maybe people will join later on. All right, just gonna share it to a few more places. And there we go. That ought to do it. Oh, I need to plug in my phone. So last, where we last left off, we had, we had just been talking about what a utter piece of crap Alexander Hamilton was, uh, despite, <laughs> for whatever reason, the the recent play, with this with his namesake, uh, or titled as his namesake, trying to rehabilitate his image for whatever reason, it turns out that in in true life he was very much anti democracy, very much pro aristocracy, wanted basically just to have. A new aristocracy without the the titles of of uh, of old of the the nobility from England, and uh, didn't want democracy because he didn't want poor people to have a voice. He thought that you know, as so many reactionaries and and conservatives like to argue, that it's just it's only natural the system that we have that that some people are are rulers and some people are ruled, and. Uh, yeah, he was just not a good person all the way around. It turns out that that Madison, I think it was James, yeah, James Madison, much cooler guy, despite again his portrayal in the movie Hamilton or in the the movie the the play Hamilton. Um, uh, Madison was all about democracy, all about giving people more of a voice. He believed in a, a, a representative form of of democracy, like we have, you know, kind of a representative republic. Uh, but he was, uh, eventually, I mean, I, I guess we don't have an aristocracy exactly, but, you know, we don't have a real great representative republic either by that, by that token. So, you know, kind of a, a, a mixed bag in terms of what we ended up getting. Uh, and, and most of the rights that we have today have been fought for very hard and have been won in spite of the way that the country was set up. Clearly, from the last chapter, if you had any doubt in your mind, go back and, and take a look at the, the series from Chapter 5. Uh, clearly, this country was set up for the benefit of the wealthy, of the owner class. Um, they, they even switched out. Uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to life, liberty, and property. Uh, I don't know if they, they, they said in the Constitution. I don't, I don't remember that appearing in the Constitution, so I'm going to check that real quick. Let's see what we can find.
no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property. And then the big caveat, without due process of law, which is uh, one of the reasons that the, the 13th Amendment could have been written as it was, that people who have been convicted of certain crimes are allowed to be slaves still. So we didn't quite abolish slavery either. Uh, not quite, because we, we look at, at prisoners as, as less than people, basically. Nor deny to any person within his jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. Now let's see where that's at. This is the ACLU. Let's put it up in the chat. Whoops. That's not what I meant to do. Here we go. Let's try copy and paste rather than cut this time. That might help. So here's what we're looking at right now. ACLU, the Bill of Rights. Uh, where was that equal protection clause? Here we go, 14th Amendment. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property, not the pursuit of happiness, without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of its laws. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting that. And yet somehow we've managed to take away rights, despite that. And... Uh, Whereas that, that is one of the amendments that have, has been used to advance rights in the past. It's now just being glossed over in favor of an even more originalist <laughs> version of the Constitution. As though the Constitution is not a, a supposed to be a living document. I mean, the whole idea of having an amendment process kind of suggests that we shouldn't just be beholden to the to 200-year-old ghosts and what they may or may have thought about modern day um just a thought but anyway interesting that still you, you're not you're not supposed to be able to be denied of life liberty or property and yet you have no right to health care you have no right to housing you have no right to food um these are things which directly can directly uh threaten your right to life your right to liberty um and I guess property, if you don't have property, technically, you don't have a right to it either. So, interesting that. And equal protection, how they can even be considering looking at things like abolishing uh, same-sex marriage is beyond me. Absolutely beyond me. How can you have equal protection when people are arbitrarily being treated differently? Just because of some puritanical notion of, of morality makes no sense to me so yeah uh, but you know as always constitution other founding documents a lot more aspirational than <laughs> actually being a, a necessarily guard, guiding principle in, in lawmaking in this country so you gotta take it for what it is anyway let's move on to the new chapter um so just to give a little bit more about it this is just the description from the the video that we're going to be watching uh so in chapter six zinn discusses the many contributions women in the early united states along with the damaging patriarchal society that colonized many significant more equitable civilizations in the americas interesting this should be a good one and i'm gonna bring it up on screen I've been forgetting to do that lately, so I'm going to make sure to do it this time. And here we go. As always, this is a space of learning. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, the only bad questions are, one asked, are ones asked in bad faith. Other than that, pretty much anything goes. Also, please try and stay on topic. You know, I know I go on tangents from time to time. Uh, but I, I like to kind of try and keep things at least somewhat relevant to the thing that we're looking at, at at the given moment. And so that tonight would be this book in particular, but also women's rights and women's contributions. 
So here we go. Recording is a product of Audio Anarchy. I'm going to turn it up for everybody. A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. Chapter 6, The Intimately Oppressed. It is possible, reading standard histories, to forget half the population of the country. <laughs> the explorers were men, the landholders and merchants men, the political leaders men, the military figures men. The very invisibility of women, the overlooking of women, is a sign of their submerged status. In this invisibility, they were something like black slaves and thus slave women faced a double oppression. The biological uniqueness of women, like skin color and facial characteristics for Negroes, became a basis for treating them as inferiors. True, with women there was something more practically important in their biology than skin color, their position as childbearers, but this was not enough to account for the general push backward for all of them in society, even those who did not bear children, or those too young or too old for that. It seems that their physical characteristics became a convenience for men who could use, exploit, and cherish someone who was at the same time servant, sex mate, companion, and bearer, teacher, warden of his children. Isn't that interesting that that's almost verbatim how your, your garden variety reactionary will describe the role of women. It's basically doing everything for the man, living in, in his service, um, no consideration to any sort of, of non-heteronormative coupling. Uh, those are just supposed to be suppressed forms, apparently. Uh, and yeah, <clears throat> just a, a very strict and rigid view of what women are. And basically they are, as you said, just, you know, homemaker that you can also have sex with. Who will also raise your kids, so nanny, add that on top, um, you know, mender of things, uh, and then in return, she said she gets security, financial security, uh, and not much else, because in that sort of a relationship, it, pretty much everything is, is a one-way street, and she's just supposed to be thankful to be alive, thankful to have a roof over her head. And a provider. As though the, the man could provide all that stuff uh, without having a wife. You know. And, and you know, still have kids that would need then child care, uh, education. Um, would need to have someone else to cook for him. Uh, on and on. Lots and lots of just unpaid labor that is unappreciated in this sort of a, a conception of things. Moving on. Societies based on private property and competition in which monogamous families became practical units for work and socialization found it especially useful to establish this special status of women. Something akin to a house slave in the matter of intimacy and oppression, and yet requiring because of the intimacy and long-term connection with children, a special patronization which on occasion, especially in the face of a show of strength, could slip over into treatment as an equal. An <laughs> oppression so private would turn out hard to uproot. Earlier societies in America and elsewhere where property was held in common and families were extensive and complicated, with aunts and uncles and grandmothers and grandfathers all living together, seemed to treat women more as equals than did the white societies that later overran them, bringing civilization and private property. Well, I mean, the thing is, even those white societies, until fairly recently, uh, the, especially in the working class uh, populations of, of Europe, um, and I, I would assume to the Americas, especially in immigrant populations, also had more of an extended family model of the family unit. It was not just the nuclear family. That only really became a thing when industrialization got going. Um, when, you know, at various times when it was actually a possibility to raise an entire family on a single income from one worker because uh, of things like uni unionization. Uh, and, uh, and also as, as a way of, 
you know, manipulating things to be able to sell people more stuff. Because if you have an extended family, they may not need as many vehicles. They may not need as many, you know, home appliances. They can all share stuff, you know. You don't have to have a washer and dryer for, for every uh, grouping of, of people in the household. Um, you don't even need as much space necessarily. Um, I think there's a big reason that or one of the one of the reasons that you see so much uh, one bedroom and studio places being built nowadays is that it's very profitable because then you can charge every single unit to have its separate bathrooms, its separate <clears throat> uh, appliances, its separate everything that go that that must be a part of every unit now, rather than having you know three four bedroom places. And also there's, you know, prejudice against children as destructive and also a, 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 a desire to have more elderly people as well because they don't have children in school that, that may burden the, the property tax system. And they tend to have at least some disposable income because they're on a fixed income. So assuming they can afford to eat and live, they will have extra money and extra time to spend it. Um, so they're seen as, as good that way. You know, they, they tend to be not involved in crime. Uh, you know, whether or not they were in their younger days, they're just getting to a point where they, they physically can't anymore. So there's a lot of reasons why, you know, you see a lot of new developments being senior living as well. But all of that, all of that is to say that this, this wasn't always the case. This wasn't always the tradition. So when you hear conservatives and reactionaries hearkening back to some imagined perfect past with the nuclear family and, you know, the 2.4 children, the, the detached single family home with the, the two cars in the garage, one for the man to go to work and the other for the woman to go shopping while he's gone. And, um, you know, all this suburban bliss, supposedly, that's, that's a very recent phenomenon. Um, the, the GI Bill. Uh, was a big contributor to single-family detached homes being more of the norm, especially after World War II when the veterans came back and were given money to buy a house in suburbia. It was, it, I don't know if it was through the, there were stipulations attached to it or what, but, but they tended to buy new construction, which tended to be uh, suburban in nature. And that's how we got a lot of the suburban housing stock that we have now. Um, and that just that that trend is just uh, continued continued of its own inertia as well. So my wife and I are, are looking for a home right now. So I mean, there is also the consideration that when you live with other people, especially if you have uh, an HOA involved of any kind, it can be more expensive because you're paying every month for that HOA. Of course, you get that back in, in assuming the HOA. Uh, performs its duties well, you get the, the maintenance that otherwise would be, you know, coming straight out of your pocket. Um, and through collectivizing maintenance, it tends to be a, a, a better bet in the long term, assuming it's done right. Because we, we saw a condo recently, um, beautiful old brownstone. I think it was built in the 1880s, in fact. It had been subdivided because um, there were four units basically per address and so there were some peculiar peculiarities about it like uh the back door entered through the master bedroom uh so so in order to get into the main house you'd have to go through a bedroom so if anyone came over and parked in the back they would be traipsing through your bedroom to get in and out well, that wasn't great but then also the, the main sticking points were the lack of upkeep that seemed to be taking place they had a uh, pretty, pretty decent size um, decks and patios on the back, but they were wooden and they were incredibly weathered and looked like they could give way at any moment. They were sloping away from the building. Uh, it was not good. It was not good. And then the, in the, in the uh, living room, there was a big picture window. Uh, it was like one of those three-panel ones that's, that's got like a step up and then 
you know, one main panel facing forward and two facing diagonally to the side on, on either side of it. And I stood up on there, one foot on <laughs> the, the part closest to the, the rest of the living room and the other part as close to that, that main window as possible. And it was a good four to six inch drop. You know, it was hard to tell just from standing there, but it was a significant drop. So clearly they were not maintaining these buildings. That's a, it's a long way of saying all of that. So there's no guarantees that HOAs, and, and, you know, that that building a year or two, I think it was, uh, it was probably like 2019, that that large apartment complex in Florida that collapsed because the, the HOA was mismanaging their the money and kept kicking the, the upkeep down the road. So it's no guarantee. And also when properties are seen as investment tools to a lot of people and they're looking to just you know get in have the property raised in value as much as possible and and meanwhile putting as little into it as possible so that you can get the most return on your investment that can lead to bad outcomes um, and just people's incompetence and an inability to to understand what is needed to maintain a multifamily unit but anyway, that's that's all to say that it's it's not infallible, but it tends to be that when you collectivize things like uh, property upkeep, you end up getting better results. Anyway, getting back to the, the, the book. In the Zunyi tribes of the Southwest, for instance, extended families, large clans, were based on the woman whose husband came to live with her family. It was assumed that women owned the houses and the fields belonged to the clans, and the women had equal rights to what was produced. A woman was more secure because she was with her own family and she could divorce the man when she wanted to, keeping their property. Women in the Plains Indian tribes of the Midwest did not have farming duties, but had a very important place in the tribe as healers, herbalists, and sometimes holy people who gave advice. When bands lost their male leaders, women would become chieftains. Women learned to shoot small bows, and they carried knives because among the Sioux, a woman was supposed to be able to defend herself against attack. The puberty ceremony of the Sioux was such as to give pride to a young Sioux maiden. Quote, Walk the good road, my daughter, and the buffalo herds, wide and dark as cloud shadows moving over the prairie, will follow you. Be dutiful, respectful, gentle, and modest, my daughter, and proud walking. If the pride and the virtue of the women are lost, the spring will come, but the buffalo trails will turn to grass. Be strong. With the warm, strong heart of the earth, no people goes down until their women are weak and dishonored. So I like what Zinn is doing here. He's showing that our current arrangement is not inevitable, that even within these same geographical confines, other people have lived in others. They've had more matriarchal, organized societies. Um, and and this, this one tribe that he's talking about was not alone. And I'd highly recommend for further reading on that, um, David Graeber and David Wengrow's uh, The Dawn of Everything, a really great book that, that looks very closely at uh, the, uh, the the history of uh, Native American peoples, mostly pre pre contact, but but there's a lot of it that that happened after um, colonial contact from Europeans as well, and uh, it just shows the 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 wide wide variety of ways that societies that set themselves up sometimes deliberately in opposition to other societies that live nearby. Uh, he, I, I forget what he called the phenomenon, but basically one way that you can define yourself as, as a distinct peoples is by doing things deliberately differently than your neighbors. So if your neighbors are warlike, you are more peaceful. If your neighbors have a, a, a patriarchal society, you might be more matriarchal in orientation. And that's a way that you distinguish yourself. Um, and he, and he found a lot of examples of this throughout. But the point being, there's... Uh, oh, he clicked on f Facebook instead of it. Hey, good to have you, James. Anyway, the point being that um, there are tons of ways that, that societies 
even large societies. And that's another great part of the Dawn of Everything is it goes through the massive societies that were within the confines of North America. Uh, and it goes beyond just uh, Tenochtitlan in the, the heart of the Aztec kingdom. Uh, uh, there was a whole bunch more. Uh, there was the, uh, the Olmec, who uh, died out before uh, colonial contact, I believe. Um, but they had a very, it, it seemed as though they had a very egalitarian st structured society. There was no large temples. Uh, there was no obvious residence where a king would live. Everyone pretty much had the same style household, and, and these would be households of extended families. And from everything that people can piece together, it seems as though they lived much more egalitarian, and that they all hadn't always been that way. They had started as uh, much more like the, the Aztec societies, uh, with, with a strict hierarchy, uh, that was backed up by priests and, and claims to divinity and stuff like that, but that somehow they had moved to a more egalitarian society. Uh, it's just a great book all around, so I can't recommend it enough. The Dawn of Everything. David Graeber, David Wengro. Um, yeah, let's move on. It would be an exaggeration to say that women were treated equally with men, but they were treated with respect and the communal nature of the society gave them a more important place. The conditions under which white settlers came to America created various situations for women. Where the first settlements consisted almost entirely of men, women were imported as sex slaves, child bearers, companions. In 1619, the year that the first black slaves came to Virginia, 90 women arrived at Jamestown on one ship. Quote, Agreeable persons, young and incorrupt, sold with their own consent to settlers as wives the price to be the cost of their own transportation. Bride slaves. Oh, that's that's great. Real great start to uh, the society there. Many women came in those early years as indentured servants, often teenage girls. And that's... The, the term even indentured servants, when you're expected to be a wife and to sleep with your master, that's pushing the envelope even further on that term. Uh, it's basically, I, I, and then I would assume that many of them would be child brides as well, and also sex slaves. So I love the people's history too. It's, it's really illuminating. And it's important stuff to take an honest look at. You know, this is this is one way to, to push back against all the anti-CRT wackos who have no idea what CRT even is. Um, they just know that it's supposed to make white people feel bad, and that if white people feel bad, that's bad, because white people never done nothing, which is wrong. It's important to know where our, our, our country got its start, and, and how Europeans, who are still the, the dominant cultural force on this continent... Uh, have come from, where they have come from. Um, oh, ugh. That's, yeah, basically, it's, it's not much better than that, James. Um, yeah, so it's, it's important to know, because history is not just some dead and disconnected thing in the past. It has effects that, that, that ripple through time to the present. There are families, I'm sure, from the time that he's talking about that still have influence in, in politics, have, have maintained their lineage all through out time today. And if not the families themselves, certainly a lot of the cultural ideas and a lot of the so-called Western values that conservatives like to hearken to because just saying, you know, white supremacy is out of fashion at this point. That's really what they mean when they invoke Western values and Western civilization, all that stuff. It's all just shorthand for white people on top because they're inherently better in their minds. And lived lives oh, so not yeah, much teenage girls. from slaves, nope. except that the term of service had an end. They were to be obedient to masters and mistresses. Well, and as, as we learned in previous chapters... The people that come over as indentured servants, by the time that they're done being an indentured servant, servant, even though they technically have their freedom, 
so so they no longer have a a barrier to their freedom to do whatever they want they are in no financial or material position to do what they want so they usually just ended up languishing in poverty um, or serving the same people just not calling themselves indentured servants anymore so yeah that's an important piece of context when talking about how there was a term of service for indentured servitudes. The authors of America's Working Women, Baxendall, Gordon, and Reverby, describe the situation, quote, They were poorly paid and often treated rudely and harshly, deprived of good food and privacy. Of course, these terrible conditions provoked resistance. Living in separate families without much really? contact with others in their position, indentured servants had one primary path of resistance open to them. Get to that in a second. Just think about it today. Think about it if it was possible, if it was legal, to still have indentured servants. And for the cost of a plane ticket, basically, and perhaps um, some legal fees that would be surrounded, uh, that, that would go to surrounding uh, or concern getting them citizenship eventually, uh, you could have basically a personal slave for a set number of years. Think of how many people would take advantage of that. How many people that, that, that you know, hate immigrants, but, but would love to have one be subservient to them. I'm sure it would all be the same people who now are, you know, still demanding that we build the wall, still demanding that we, you know, our, op our so-called open borders are the, the greatest threat to America. So... Just something to consider what that would be like if that sort of a system was still legal today. Uh, and just how incredibly exploitative it would be. Passive resistance. Trying to do as little work as possible and to create difficulties for their masters and mistresses. Of course, the masters and mistresses did not interpret it that way, but saw the difficult behavior of their servants as sullenness, laziness, malevolence, and stupidity. For instance, the General Court of Connecticut in 1645 ordered that a certain, quote, Susan C., for her rebellious carriage toward her mistress, to be sent to the house of correction and be kept to hard labor and a coarse diet, to be brought forth the next lecture day to be publicly corrected, and so to be corrected weekly until order be given to the contrary. Sexual abuse of masters against servant girls became commonplace. The court records of surprise, Virginia surprise. and other colonies show masters brought into court for this, so we can assume that these were especially flagrant cases. There must have been many more instances which were never brought to public light. As, as tends to be the case when someone in a very, you know, weakened position of power is is assaulted by a person of power. That's the reason it took so long for Harvey Weinstein to come to justice, because he was an incredibly powerful man. So you you don't just go forward with allegations like that because he has the the means legally and monetarily to ruin you, to threaten your life even. Uh, so that's why these these cases they tend to stay hidden for decades, years, uh, a lot. And, you know, at the very least, and uh, why it takes a whole lot of people to come forward, and why they tend to come forward all at once, because once one domino falls, other people feel emboldened to share their story as well. So it's not as though they're just jumping on the bandwagon, uh, or or trying to, you know, pile on and, and cash in on on uh, some sort of a witch hunt, as as the conservatives would have you believe. It's that it's dangerous to do so unless you do it with force and with an overwhelming corroboration of evidence against the person. And so, yeah, surprise, surprise, that, that incredibly powerful white men, in this case, uh, abused their power and took advantage of the women who they were supposedly helping, bringing them over to America. And I... I'm guessing that they're just going to get the same sort of slap on a wrist as as so many powerful men accused of, of sexual crimes get today. But let's see. 
1756, Elizabeth Spriggs wrote to her father about her servitude, quote, What we unfortunate English people suffer here is beyond the probability of you in England to conceive. Let it suffice that I, one of the unhappy number, am toiling almost day and night, and very often in the horse's drudgery, with only this comfort, that you bitch you do not half enough, and then tied up and whipped to that degree that you'd not serve an animal, scarce anything but Indian corn and salt to eat, and that even begrudged. Nay, many Negroes are better used, almost naked, no shoes, no stockings to wear. What rest we can get is to wrap ourselves up in a blanket and lie upon the ground. Whatever horrors can be imagined in the transport of black slaves to America must be multiplied for black women, who are often one-third of the cargo. Slave traders reported, quote, I saw pregnant women give birth to babies while chained to corpses, which our drunken overseers had not removed. Packed spoon fashion, they often gave birth to children in the scalding perspiration from the human cargo. On board the ship was a young Negro woman chained to the deck who had lost her senses as soon as she was purchased and taken on board. A woman named Linda Brent, who escaped from slavery, told of another burden. Quote, But now I entered on my fifteenth year, a sad epoch in the life of a slave girl. My master began to whisper foul words in my ear. Young as I was, I could not remain ignorant of their import. My master met me at every turn, reminding me that I belonged to him, and swearing by heaven and earth that he would compel me to submit to him. If I went out for a breath of fresh air after a day of unwearied toil, his footsteps dogged me. If I knelt by my mother's grave, his dark shadow fell on me even there. The light heart which nature had given me became heavy with sad forebodings. Even free white women, not brought as servants or slaves, but as wives of the early settlers, faced special hardships. Eighteen married women came over on... Really? That, that word they, they freeze on Twitch? Yeah, I know it's, it's definitely a racial term that is out of fashion, and it's not one that I would say myself. Uh, I, uh, I guess I'm kind of surprised that, that even that is uh, banned language. Um, but yeah, so, sorry, I, I should have given a, a, a content warning ahead of time, but, but yes, there is outdated use of, of racial terms that are just not seen as, as, uh, appropriate anymore. Well, hello. Hi. Are you going to come on? Yeah. Okay. Oh, you're going to need the air conditioner, aren't you? Yeah. All right. Well, I have to set things up for Amanda to join the show. Oh, you're just saying. Oh, I, see. I was talking to James. So we're learning about the horrible treatment of uh, women in early America. Um, in early America? We, we can definitely see some echoes too today, for sure. Uh, they were talking about how a lot of early women were taken over as indentured servants, which basically was just a euphemism for slaves. Sex, sex slaves, yeah. They were expected to, to take the men as husbands and do all their wifely duties and whatnot. So. I did my way fleet duty. I unloaded and reloaded the dishwasher. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. It's, it's usually my duty, but I do appreciate you doing that. He cooks. I do cook. I, I cook dinner tonight. And breakfast. And breakfast. I make my own lunch. True. <laughs> Gold star me. Way to go. I did it myself. Oh. 
Sorry, continue. Yeah, uh, and so now we're learning about the even more horrific conditions of actual slaves. So pleasant times ahead. Oh, great! I'm so excited. Yeah, now well, this is this is the people's history. In the Mayflower, three were pregnant, and one of them gave birth to a dead child before they landed. Childbirth and sickness plagued the women. By the spring, only four of those 18 women were still alive. Jeez. Those who lived, sharing the work of building a life in the wilderness with their men, were often given a special respect because they were so badly needed. And when men died, women often took up the men's work as well. All through the first century and more, women on the American frontier seemed close to equality with their men. But all women were burdened with ideas carried over from England with the colonists, influenced by Christian teachings. English law was summarized in a document of 1632 entitled, The Laws or Resolutions of Women's Rights. Quote. Before we get to that, um, I did want to bring up, uh, just this, this has nothing to do with the text itself, but just since I have your attention right now, I wanted to bring up a GoFundMe of a friend of mine uh, you, you may know him. He's, a, he's a, another Twitch streamer, Freddy Yeti, and he's unexpectedly facing, facing uh, housing insecurity. So I'm going to post the link to his GoFundMe. Um, so if you can spare anything, please do. If you have a Twitch Prime sub or just, a, you know, if you feel like subbing to the, his channel, I'm sure that would be helpful as well. Um, It's nice to be nice. Yeah. I don't know if it's with two Ds. Let me check. Look at the puppy. Yeah, they have two dogs they live with, and they're they're just in need of some help. I'm just going to do my best guess it at Freddy Yeti because I can't look it up right at the moment unless he's on right now. Doesn't look, doesn't look that way. So anyway, if you have anything to spare, please help out Freddy Yeti. Real cool guy. Um, great streamer. Just a great person. So, so yeah. Just wanted to mention that. All right, so about women's rights. In this consolidation, which we call wedlock, is a locking together. It is true that man and wife are one person, but understand in what manner. When a small brook or little river incorporateth with Rodanus, Humber, or the Thames, the poor rivulet loseth her name. <laughs> and apparently loses all of the contributions to that, that river as well. And, of course... Uh, you know, we're, we're led to believe that only the man could, could be the Thames or the, the Humber or uh, whatever other river is being invoked. Couldn't possibly be the other way around. And it always has to be, one has to be bigger than the other. They can't just join and yeah, make a new Yeah, be equal, river. even though that's what they say yeah. in the little ceremonies when people do unite together. Yeah. As yeah. equals. I mean, literally, it is not the same river. The, the river that comes after the joining of, of even small inlets is not the same river afterward. It is, right. it is literally composed of, of particles that it didn't start with. And uh, it's, its character is going to be different, therefore. So no matter what the size, you don't just get totally subsumed by uh, a larger body of water. Um, it's just not how it works. Right. And it's just, it's a really shitty way to conceive of things, so it's don't a, do that. And like, I love the sacrifice her name. Right. I, I never changed my name when we wed. Yeah. And I get a lot of shit about it. Which is stupid. Everyone yeah, should have like, the choice to choose you know, what name they want to have. Right. But it's like, oh, well, you're married supposed to I was like listen we went into this and he had a very clear understanding that I am not a submissive type of woman and he is not a submissive type of man like we yeah. 
we we shared chores. We shared, together. you know, household duties. We shared decision making. Yeah. We don't just have one dominant person in the relationship. I know that's totally that's outside okay. the the realm of imagination for a lot of hierarchically minded people, but we're kind of living proof that it's possible. Yeah, and somehow we're both, despite being broke AF, <laughs> are very happy. Yeah. Definitely happy in our really arrangement. Moving on about the rivulet loseth in her name. A woman, as soon as she is married, is called covert, that is, veiled, as it were. Clouded and overshadowed, she hath oh. lost her stream. Hold on now. Oh, well, look who it is. It is Mr. Dan Platt of the Three Left Show. How's it going, Dan? Hi, Dan. You are muted or you're not coming through. <laughs> Still not hearing anything. Push the talk now emoji. <laughs> oh, if only it were that simple. How about now? Yep. You're coming through now. How you doing All tonight? Right. It's okay. I was just slightly bored more like bored enough uh, that I'm like, you know what? Uh, you know, and I was, you know, going through YouTube stuff. Sure. Um start drawing and I'm like, Oh, but you know what, you're live. Let's see if you have the link in the green room. For sure. Um since um, the second half of the week, I'll be doing all the chores. Tonight, I was uh, like, okay, it's a nice and off night. Since it's yeah, the last yeah. night that it should be extremely, the, the, the extreme mugginess. Oh, that, that's good. You know, that's I, can, I can barely barely keep my shirt on, but uh, yeah. put it on. I'll put it on for the camera. Yeah, just, well, let me, let me put the light that. on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's uh, it's finally gonna get back down to the mid '80s highs of mid '80 yeah. here in New York. So yeah, I'm, funny. I'm just you, you looking are... looking forward to that. I can tell you, uh -huh. for a big time. You, you guys seem to trail our weather patterns by like uh, two or three days. It seems because we were muggy and hot AF just a few days ago. Uh, the speed of the wind. That's right. <laughs> Ah, uh, so you thought you'd kick back and learn about the, the horrible atrocities the U.S. committed uh, throughout its history. Uh, so let me get this straight. You leftists are indoctrinating <laughs> whoever's watching to hate America. That's right. Is that, that's, that's what the, you're doing. That's the we're entire gonna, purpose of our project. We're going to gonna hate America even manufacturing. more. Hate America even more. How uh, dare you, sir? I know. I know. Horrible, <laughs> but you know, boredom is the true enemy. Um, mm. Boredom is what uh, you know, I was just listening to. Um, Douglas Lane's new channel, Subulation, oh, yeah. and Subulation. he had a speaker, or, and it was kind of about the boredom of late stage capitalism, and and just tying in the, in the context of mass shooters that mm. what they really all have in common is that they're bored and that, that the boredom be, is yeah. so oppressive that like, you know, and people can be bored of all kinds of things. You can consume a lot of media. You can have all this stuff. You can be comfortable and be really bored. Yeah. And there are people who are totally oppressed and working really hard, you know, overworked, but they're not bored. Maybe because they're overworked. You don't have time to be bored. Yeah. So, um, although that doesn't, well, I don't know if going postal, yeah, maybe, you know, those, I mean, that's usually the postal work like, workers. That was only like, that was like the first public or in a yeah. workplace. But the yeah. first, um, it was going all the way back in the, like, it was in the 70s, of course, when all this started, the nightmare. 
that there was the first kind of school shooting. And it was someone who shot two kids as they were coming in the school um, or like a crowd. And, and mm. her motive when interviewed after the fact was that, you know, she hates Mondays, which is, I guess, where that yeah. came from. Oh, I don't know if really? that was the first utterance of like oh. the in the pop culture of like I wouldn't be surprised. I that, that... hate Mondays, and it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me at all that so that that that, that attitude of yeah. like I hate the grind, no matter what the grind is. I have to disrupt it, and you know I have to take it out on everyone else or um, make like exciting, uh, even if it's you know ending my own life in an exciting way. Yeah, and, and 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 those whether it's chuds on the internet, who you know are just looking to break the monotony, so to speak, you know, right. make make their mark. They're bored. Right. That's why they're online all the time. It's they're true. bored. So we got to break. And, and and Lane is kind of like uh, pointing out, like we're all bored. We're all bored. we're all waiting for revolution. We're like, like revolution. The next world cannot be born. The world is dying, but the new one cannot be born. It is in silver, mm -hmm. and and we're, and that bores us. And we have to. It's and true. The advice was that we have to sit with our boredom, and kind of, kind of push through it. Be aware of it at the very least, so it doesn't. So it's like it's like the abyss of nihilism. You know, we don't want it to. When it looks back, you know, we 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 look it in the face. At least. Wow. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely a lot of truth to that. Definitely so anyway, uh, on to, to I'm just all right. So where are you in the chapter? Uh, so we're talking about um, some of the the early conceptions of, or early in America conceptions of the role of women and and how they're supposed to be subservient, basically. Mm -hmm. That sort of stuff. Writers of the of the New Republic. Yeah, yeah. like just general. Yeah, I, right. So here we go. I may more truly, far away, say to a married woman, her new self is her superior, her companion, her master. Julia Spreel describes the woman's legal situation in the colonial period. Quote. The husband's control over the wife's person extended to the right of giving her chastisement, but he was not entitled to inflict permanent injury or death on his wife. As for property, quote, besides absolute possession of his wife's property and a life estate in her lands, the husband took any other income that might be hers. He collected wages earned by her labor. Naturally, it followed that the proceeds of the joint labor of husband and wife belonged to the husband. For a woman to have a child out of wedlock was a crime, and colonial court records are full of cases of women being arraigned for bastardy, the father of the child untouched by the law and on the loose. A colonial periodical of 1747 reproduced a speech of Miss Polly Baker before a court of judicature at Connecticut near Boston in New England, where she was prosecuted the fifth time for having a bastard child. The speech was Benjamin Franklin's ironic invention. Quote, May it please the honorable bench to indulge me in a few words. I am a poor, unhappy woman who have no money to fee lawyers to plead for me. This is the fifth time, gentlemen that I have been dragged before your court on the same account. Twice I paid heavy fines, and twice have been brought to public punishment for want of money to pay those fines. This may have been agreeable to the laws, and I don't dispute it, but since laws are sometimes unreasonable in themselves and therefore repealed, and others bear too hard on the subject in particular circumstances, I take the liberty to say that I think this law by which I am punished both unreasonable in itself and particularly severe with regard to me. Abstracted from the law, I cannot conceive what the nature of my offense is. I have brought five fine children into the world at the risk of my life. I have maintained them well by my own industry without burdening the township and would have done it better if it had not been for the heavy charges and fines I have paid. Nor has anyone the least cause of complaint against me unless, perhaps, the ministers of justice, because I have had children without being married, by which they missed a wedding fee. But can this be a fault of mine? What? 
must Still poor going. young women do? Whom customs and nature forbid to solicit the men and who cannot Did force themselves upon Did he mean that Benjamin Franklin hunting? published the speech? That must be him what he meant. Publisher. They published it, not that, I mean, he says, like, we get this by way of Ben Franklin. That's what he means, right? I think, I think that's what, what is meant. When the laws take no care to provide them any, and yet severely punish that they do their duty without them, the duty of the first and great command of nature and nature's God increase and multiply, a duty from the steady performance of which nothing has been able to deter me. But for its sake, I have hazarded the laws of public esteem and have frequently endured public disgrace and punishment, and therefore ought, in my humble opinion, instead of a whipping, to have a statue erected in my memory. The father's So it's, it's, it's interesting. They, they, they cloak themselves in morality and, and doing what's best for society and that sort of thing, but, but all these punishments, as is the case with, say, abortion bans today, uh, end up just ruining people's lives for decisions that they make that they, that go outside of the bounds of, of this uh, sort of morality. And so it it's ends up making society worse. She ends up being a, a more of a burden because she's unable to pay uh, and, you know, taken away from her children in one way and another. So, yeah. is, that a, is that a hypothetical question, James? What is or, or, or a sarcastic question? To answer it seriously, uh, public esteem is our respectability. <laughs> oh, all right. So Amanda's gonna go get ready for bed. So, thank mm -hmm. you for joining us, Amanda. Bye, Amanda. But yeah, pu public esteem would be like your reputation, the way that you're looked at, and you know. It can affect if people, you know, especially in that time, if people would do business with you, um, especially since small towns are much more commonplace as a way of living, so everyone knew each other. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes it seems like good politeness to ask a question sarcastically. So you, A, like because you may be on it, like you half know something, and you don't want to seem dumb by actually asking, hey, what is this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, at least that's how it seems with some certain immature people. Not that you're one of those. <laughs> My comment is that um, there seems to be, a, like, I hear it in certain ways. I don't know how I got this idea that the control of women's body is much a Victorian value, or this is something that oh, kind yes. of got more, maybe just got more intense, but it was like always there before, but it got mm. more intense in the Victorian period. Um, why? Obviously, there's study. This that's a question that's been studied, but I think Cal well, well, the Caliban switch um, and other more recent, like in this millennium, work on history of women in Western Europe is or Caliban the witch is the title about how the control of women's bodies kind of goes more to the renaissance the creation of humanism and but also the transformation of the economy from kind of base feudalism to slowly evolving into an industrial economy mm -hmm. which but to go wider that, that, that makes sense yeah but to go wider than europe i mean most societies have some kind of uh, well, but if, especially if they're patriarchal, but I'm sure mm -hmm. even matriarchal societies have a control over reproduction in some way in people's bodies. Right. They'll have there would be rules of the tribe or rules of the society. I mean, whether it be it's not just the civilized, you know, um, step peoples, very patriarchal. Um, I mean, actually, but there's diversity because some tribes would have more like egalitarian modes right but then mm -hmm. other times maybe it just depended on the century even it's not just how much right. over time but based on the century there'll be more control because of mm, scarcity or century where it's more droughts or it's colder you know with the little ice age um 
but I just know various like historical examples where like the Mongols, very patriarchal, very, you know, women were practically chattel slaves um, versus Scythians, ancient Scythians, you know, where the Amazon myth come women, a tribe where women had an equal part to play in both tribal custom and world warfare. Hmm. I've, I've never heard of the Scythians. That's interesting. Well, the Scythians yeah. were, were a broad tribe, but I mean, there, there are sub-tribes where, um, uh, I don't know if this is accurate information, but the women weren't allowed to marry until they had made their first kill. Um, and they were kind of auxiliary soldiers in hmm. war bands and stuff like that as they would go a raiding. And they, wow. they, they uh, existed in uh, around um, the Crimean area. Oh, okay. Which is why when some Greeks settled there, um, they they traded with them or encountered them, and obviously the how they did things got exaggerated. They let women fight. It's practically <laughs> a tribe of fighting women. It's just women, in fact. It just gets, you know, game of telephone. By the time oh, yeah. Greece, it's like, there's a tribe all right. of all women. They kill the men. But it was more like the women fought with the men, or the women went off to fight, you know, near the backup archers or something hmm. like that. Hmm. And they had breastplate, they had plates that protected their boob, boob you know. Oh, their that. boob, actual boob armor? Or on one side, like, you know. Oh, uh, okay. And um, sure. for the archery. Because, I mean, these are these are step, step horse horseback step. I mean, also, you know, the... The myth of the centaur, you know, you had men who were so natural in the saddle, it was like they were man and beast for one. Right, yeah, yeah. So they might as well be this, one, yeah. This joke was played off in a um, very forgotten movie, but it was like, um, not Hercules, but or was it like Hercules? I don't know, but it was, it was with, I don't know if it was The Rock, but it was like a Greek, like it was ancient Greece, and you had... A team of warriors that I think included Hercules, but like mm -hmm. that's right. And it was, but it was like a real life Hercules where like his labors were all just exaggerated stories. Like yeah, he killed a uh, lion, but it was a regular lion. Or yeah, um, or like you know th this and that, and the stories are exaggerated. Or it's him and his band of mercenaries like pumped up the stories. Like they would use all kinds of chicanery to trick people into thinking sure. Like, Better, better than he was. Um, both it, his legend. Yeah. The team is like a, a shaman-like guy who's very superstitious. You know, the guy, the fate, you know, gods will kill me when the gods kill me. So he has mm -hmm. this nature where it's like, you know, he's going walking into danger. Like, well, you know, if it's my day to die. You know? um, an Amazon, a woman warrior, um, and then someone else I forget. It, it's a pretty fun movie. Basically, like they're... This try this town is being attacked by centaurs, and eventually they come across. You know the centaurs appear, and it's horseback warriors. It's horseback, and, yeah. And they're not really that surprised, but you know. <laughs> interesting. I wonder how much of a connection there is to material conditions and and proclivity to oppress women more. If it is just often a reaction to scarcity, and and so you know. The, maybe that that leads to more um, competition and that sort of thing, and uh, then the domination of, of anyone that that doesn't win that competition. Um, it's it probably frightens various progressive people because to acknowledge that maybe women's liberation is tied to how good we have it now, hmm. uh, the the bounty, the what is it, the prosperity of post-war America, um, as well as the, the whole the global economy, even, that women's rights increase and the women's liberation increases, uh, autonomy, not only the, with the creation of the pill, but of course, you could think of how like the creation of the pill is a result of raising standards of material bounty. Um, sure. The industry yeah. of yeah, Petro so you can definitely Petro see the, the the pharmaceutical industry, you know, its existence in addition, and sure. and all of that can fade or or 
crack or it can collapse. Um, and and this is where the Handmaid's Tale kind of comes in as speculative fiction, where you know things get bad of the American Empire. Mm-hmm. American regions, at the very least, will devolve and go backwards. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just I don't think it's uh, inevitable that that everything has to break right in in times of of um, hardship. I think it could go the opposite way. I think it you know there's examples of it going the opposite way and people just banding together, realizing that we're stronger, have a better chance of survival when we work together and don't exclude and can't afford to exclude anybody. Yeah, if, that's where you know, that's where on the other hand, modernity is different. Mm-hmm. That with the coming of modernity when times are bad as in because the bad times are made by the capitalist economic cycle as i mean the bounty is created by it but so are the recessions so Mm -hmm. we are in recessions which by the way lasted 15 years not just happened every 15 years in the past you would get the creation of labor and socialist movements in those bad times so you would get a left-wing or egalitarian movements as a result of those bad times. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, kind of flies in the face of that, you know, what is it? The fourth turning theory. Where <laughs> That's <laughs> all. Tim, Tim Pool is so yeah. all about, you know, the, well, the, Tim um, Pool is all about, about pseudo everything. I mean, yeah, he's right, a pseudo right, right. thinker. Um, That's the just idea that, uh, him. I mean, the, the the story is a very old meme. It goes back to the Middle Ages. Yeah. Um, it was created by an Islamic scholar. By Islamic, I mean he was Iraqi, and mm-hmm. and he traveled around and formulated his theory of history, which was cyclical, which itself isn't that uh, old. I mean that young. He formulated it and wrote it down. But in Roman, in the Roman Empire, or the classical age. There seemed to be, I mean, by historical research and archaeology, that there was also this cyclical view of time. That it was mm-hmm. not this progression, but things just happen over and over again. is It's just the way of things, like the seas, like the seasons. Um, sure. And so the turning is also kind of maybe thinking back to that, you know, to, to react and say like, well, we're not going to believe in the linear progression of time, as far as like progress is a certain thing, because obviously. We need we rightfully should dispel ourselves of that myth, but we should all just also dispel ourselves of the circle circular myth of right. this is the way it has to happen. Right. Um, or that to well, here's what everyone else doesn't consider uh, in this, but I see it expressed in some memes, which I didn't really get a handle on until I was an art where progress can be a spiral going upwards. That you you are going in a circle, but it's a little higher than the last one, mm. so it's viral. Um, put some yeah, Gurren Lagan in there. You ever watch Gurren yeah. Lagan? No, I don't. I have not heard no. that name before. It's an anime um, with a motif of spirals, which is very rare in media. Um, but spirals are our friends. Uh, it's, there's a, there's the slow eco movement that has like a snail as its symbol yeah slow food and stuff like but it's a snail also has the spiral shell spiral right. you know is, is is growth occurs in cycles sure. but it's ever larger yeah it's all building on itself and it's not just you know all the way forward and it's not just the the idea of a pendulum of it just endlessly swinging back and forth it's like swinging backwards but then you do also come to a better place and you you know yeah. There's, there's forward momentum and backward and but the baby yeah, baby sure. politics is like a pendulum oh well, it goes left and then it goes right yeah, and it goes right. left and then it goes yeah it goes right endless endless swinging yeah. baby, baby stuff yeah well that's 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 the uh the uh smarter than everyone centrist sort of view that well it's all just gonna you know center around me and, and just go back and forth over what i believe but yeah there's okay, not much enough. to it <laughs> All right, let's move on. Position in the family was expressed in The Spectator, an influential periodical in America and England. Quote, Nothing is more gratifying to the mind of man than power or dominion. 
And, as I am the father of a family, I am perpetually taken up in giving out orders, in prescribing duties, in hearing parties, in administering justice, and in distributing rewards and punishments. In short, sir, I look upon my family as a patriarchal sovereignty in which I am myself both king and priest. Jeez. <laughs> no wonder that Puritan New England carried over this subjection of women. At a trial of a woman for daring to complain about the work a carpenter had done for her, one of the powerful church fathers of Boston, the Reverend John Cotton, said, quote, oh, John Cotton. That a husband should yeah. obey his wife, and not the wife the husband, that is a false principle. For God hath put another law upon women. Wives, be subject to your husbands in all things. A best-selling pocket book published in London was Not widely based. read in the American colonies in the <laughs> 1700s. It was called Advice to a Daughter. Quote, You must first lay it down for a foundation in general that there is an inequality in sexes. And that for the better economy of the world. The men who were to be the lawgivers had the large share of reason bestowed upon them by which means your sex is the better prepared for the compliance that is necessary for the performance of those duties which seemed to be most properly assigned to it. Your sex wanteth our reason for your conduct, and our strength for your protection. Ours wanteth your gentleness to soften and to entertain us. <laughs> <laughs> Against this powerful education, it is remarkable that women nevertheless rebelled. Women rebels have always faced special disabilities. They live under the daily eye of their master, and they are isolated, one from the other, in households, thus missing the daily camaraderie which has given heart to rebels of other oppressed groups. Anne Hutchinson was a religious woman, mother of 13 children, and knowledgeable about healing with herbs. She defied the church fathers in the early years of the Massachusetts Bay Colony by insisting that she and other ordinary people could interpret the Bible for themselves. A good speaker, she held meetings to which more and more women came, and even a few men, and soon groups of 60 or more were gathering at her home in Boston to listen to her criticisms of local ministers. John Winthrop, the governor described her as, quote, a woman of haughty and fierce carriage, of a nimble wit and active spirit, and a very voluble tongue, more bold than a man, though in understanding and judgment inferior to many women. <laughs> wow. Well, that, Anne that, Hutchinson was put on trial. To... What's that? Those are all compliments, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except maybe for maybe the last part, part but <laughs> yeah. the rest was positive. Uh-huh. Yeah, he just he couldn't uh, he couldn't uh couldn't just leave it at only compliments. Oh. Had had to take her down a notch at the same time. <laughs> right. Backhanded. That's right. All right. Moving on. Twice by the church for heresy and by the government for challenging their authority. At her civil trial, she was pregnant and ill, but they did not allow her to sit down until she was close to collapse. At her religious trial, she was interrogated for weeks, and again she was sick, but challenged her questioners with expert knowledge of the Bible and remarkable eloquence. Mm. When finally she repented in writing, they were not satisfied. They said, quote, her repentance is not in her countenance, unquote. She was banished from the colony, and when she left for Rhode Island in 1638, 35 families followed her. Wow. Then she went to the shores of Long Island, where Indians who had been defrauded of their land thought she was one of their enemies. They killed her and her family. Twenty years later, the one person back in Massachusetts Bay who had spoken up for her during her trial, Mary Dyer, was hanged by the government of the colony, along with two other Quakers for, quote, rebellion, sedition, and presumptuous obtruding themselves, unquote. Damn, Quakers. Um, some I've friends. Always been there on, on the progressive edge, though. Some some friends, right? Yeah. It's, it's just the... It's the not just in hindsight, because there's, again, these rebels, so to speak, show 
that the the better morality is always there under the surface. Mm, yeah, it's that the, there's a power structure or status quo enforced by the wealthy that are just there to tamp it down and enforce the the bad stuff, mm. and that it's always there, regardless of you know whatever other underlying philosophies that there are, whether it's hell just protestants in the first place that are all supposed to be about that you know you can interpret the bible for yourself and you right. can read it Don't for yourself intermediary and yet yeah, that's supposed to be pastor and yet the the there's a class of pastors that's cling to their own sense of power and righteousness they're all sometimes depending on the town little uh count um judge frollo's and another type of villains. Yeah. Um, but, and they, and they exist everywhere. And this, and this is where, you know, anarchists always have the point of like, look, if there's a hierarchy, if there's this power, there's this ability to exert power. Um, even though Protestantism and other humanist philosophy of the Renaissance was meant to devolve such strict hierarchies of church, king, and God. Yeah. It kind of breaks it down to say you can read the Bible in your own language, and but at the same time, it's a step forward. But then the Protestant churches still retain a lot of the same toxic hierarchies, right. Calvinism especially, which is oh, yes. has predestination and in fact is all about moral purity over anything else. Um. And in fact, you know, seem, you know, values intellectual pursuits only so far as they glorify, you know, one's purity. Sure. Um, I have a good, I have a book about, it was a re, it, basically it's a research project of a socialist in the 40s hmm. to call it like kind of have a survey of every, to, every utopia in Western reading, writing. Hmm. And she goes through and kind of, digests and summarizes every written form of utopia spends a fair amount of time i read at least this is where i kind of i went through the ones in the from the renaissance and and there are differences and also there's similarities um not just going from the the utopia but there's like six others written and one of them was written by a calvinist and they're all very much something that a lot of utopias have in common especially renaissance ones but I'll read the rest to see if they get better, but they all very much are very orderly and extremely hierarchical and think things are only work out and they're fair because of how everyone seems to have a place and hmm. know it. Hmm. And the difference in one of them was that intellectual pursuits were actually not meant to be shared, but were a source of power for the rulers. Uh -huh. And, and that sharing information with the outside was actually that was a, that was the big crime. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll have to read it again to see which ones were more like sexually liberated. But the point was none of them were. Yeah. Um, these visions of, of a better of a better Interesting. society. Interesting, uh, isn't it? Um, yeah. It was all in fact sex is very controlled, very controlled. That's why I really liked you know this Aristophanes play, Ancient Greece where the the women take over Athens and declare that everyone should just have sex uh, and so on or something like that. Or no, no, that, that like you can't have, um, you can't marry like a good looking woman until you like have sex with an ugly woman and, <laughs> and vice versa. So like, uh -huh. so everybody gets some sex, which is, <laughs> yeah, make of that as you will. <laughs> But um, it's a funny play. It's called the um, the Congress the Congresswoman. Congresswoman, interesting. Or the Assemblywoman, I think. But that, that's short. interesting. What what you bring up about utopias? I wonder why there's not more left wing utopias. Is 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 utopianism like that sort of utopianism? Like actually trying to build a utopian, just like inherently a an exercise in hierarchy and hierarchy and control, and and therefore. Tends towards know. the right. I, I don't agree. Um, oh, you don't agree? 
I'm just saying that in the past it certainly it w was, and yeah. Um, but there are, I mean, you have the anarcho-socialist news from nowhere, which very much is all about trying to imagine a society that doesn't have any hierarchy. Um, it's also one where industry is very small and cities don't really exist. Okay. Um, that London is like a size of a more of like a town or at least a series of villages that are just close together. So it's like a town. So sure. Um, so, but, so, so oh, I mean, yes, in, in, in speculative fiction and stuff like that, there certainly are visions of left wing utopia. Uh, the dispossessed is what is one of my favorite books that, that looks at, at that. But I'm just talking about like when people actually try and, and, and act it, is that inherently a, Oh, just just lift. Yeah, utopianism is stemfully in the most of the 20th century has been out of favor. Um, it, it itself was like a certain tendency, left. You know, a uh, socialist utopian. You know, versus mm -hmm. scientific socialist. You have the utopian right. socialist, which is which is more of a uh, insult by Marx and company sure, of sure. the idealists who is, yeah. are just kind of get like the Calvinists, putting the morality on things and trying to govern and or or do politics in purely moral terms, which right stand up is, is yeah. all the things we criticize about on the online left that mm -hmm. you're left with purity, uh, a search of puritanism that and to have any power, even to be elected to your local council, will force you to exit that realm of purity you will be making compromises just right. by having political office right that's you true you'll be doing good but you will not be pure anymore which was the sense i got from this interview with an anarchist who there were so many anarchists that lived in this florida town that they were able to elect an anarchist council person uh, on a platform of being anti-cop and various things and she only lasted a term and did not, I don't know if she just didn't want, couldn't get reelected or didn't, she didn't try. Sure. Um, and came to the conclusion that having, having the power in the state or this, you know, in the system was a waste of time and I could only do harm reduction, not built power. You know, it, it was, this was in a post left podcast from crime think. Oh, okay. So, it gave me the sense of defeatism that there's really no point in trying these things. I'm like, surely you could, it would really help your other anarchist projects to have someone on the city council, like in a permanent fashion. Yeah, you would think. Terms. Or, or like, if you did all this in one term, what maybe you could have done even more in a second term. For sure. Uh, or you, eventually you'd be mayor and then you mm -hmm. could have the police force. But yeah. she was like, no, 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 no. As much as I was anti comp, I couldn't really. Uh, do anything to limit the police's power because the police is tied to property and you know i'm not going to do revolutionary things from the seat of council i was there to enforce the laws of the city not right. to change them is the way she saw it which she has a point but again that's you're losing some of the purity of being a great anarchist mm -hmm. then you're left with dumpster diving and doing harm reduction and and or, or maybe even just thinking about prefigurative politics but like what was i just listening to with like matt crispin where like it, it felt like the bernie campaign was all about trying to prefigure a labor movement and a leftist and the left in america or mm -hmm. to have space for to prefigure and or or rather if that prefiguration has been the strategy of the left since the 70s and it's just been a holding pattern we you can't prefigure something new in the old the old does not allow you yeah. to prefigure something new. you can change yeah. what exists. And, that, and that's that's so you have to, largely true you have to start there because of the the baked in constraints of of the old but I still but, feel like you could be in a space to 
allow others who are operating a little bit outside the system to prefigure that stuff. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, when it comes to do when it comes to organizing the like the dual power in a, like in when I need, I need to use that in the real sense that like you're actually organizing a dual government. Right. Um, shadow government. Yeah. Shadow government, which the Soviets were. Yeah. That seemed to be able to exist because the Tsar's government was so weak. Yeah. That they really were on their last legs. They couldn't do more than just when there was a big protest, charge them with cavalry. Sure. Um, and maybe they had a secret police or whatever. But, you know, by that time, like the army wasn't going to put down any massive revolt. So when there was an occupy of the factories or, or, or the city of St. Petersburg, the army couldn't march in. There was no National Guard. So, yeah, and that's the kind of weakness that a state kind of has before dual power can challenge it. And it's not in the form of what's usually bandied about as dual power, where the DSA yeah. says it's dual power. Um, this was something I was just listening to, how like dual power is so it's used a little too much. Yeah. Uh, or to whatever money. whatever I'm sure. doing, that's I'm dual power. That's building. dual power. Yeah. Uh, you know, unionizing, dual power building. Even though I'm doing it mm -hmm. with like the old unions, um, uh, food not bombs. That's dual power. No, it isn't. Are you, are you gonna replace the grocery store? Are you able like be a co-op can say the dual power building, but since they're still a market actor, um, but hey, uh, sure. if they were if if the only grocery store like guess like in Ithaca uh, the main grocery store is the co-op grocery store um, though I believe there's the standard chains as well there's just um, yeah so that's just my thoughts but there's, there's obviously more too but I yeah, want to give up both you change what exists by working with what exists and that's I agree. so much I agree. yeah or we just have to educate people with our podcasts and consume media, and, and, and that's the movement. No, right. Well, and, and I don't think one set of tactics is ever going to do it anyway. Like I think we have to come at it from many different sides. You have to have people working outside the system and within the system at the same time. Otherwise, yeah, and it needs to be coordinated, getting each other's way. Yeah, uh, which there's the example of with um, ending cash bail in Illinois. Mm. I was reading about how that was coordinated with it's the story of the guy who is uh, in Obama's old state Senate seat. It's just called that. Oh, okay. But it's, you know, it's, he's, he's a DSA Democrat. And, but what's different about him is, and why he's kind of been to be a champion of the movements because, or the coalition of, of social activists is that he was elected by this coalition of activists activism and so he does in fact work for them but he's also very much liked by the democratic machine there in chicago hmm. so hmm. which i'm kind of like well why do they like him why i mean yeah, why does the chairman question. of the county of the chicago county dems which doesn't have a great history by the way um he likes this guy he's like the protege hmm. or not the protege but just like the he's 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 friendly with it all he's not apple cereal i think that was the point he was making that he built relationships with the county machine the, with the dem machine so he's both a you know component of that but also an actor for the movements and thus negotiating uh, the victory of ending cash bail and that's a victory, you know. It's, yeah, you know, it definitely not, is. It's not systemic. Um, not what it's. I'm not. I'm not even sure. Brown is a non-reformist reform, but you get those reformist things. So, but that's. Yeah. It's not the really. Victory. It's not a good thing. So yeah. It's not the victories I'm looking for, but. Well, for sure, but. I know you can you can you can assuage people's conditions a little bit, but I mean if, yeah. if inflation rises or the Fed raises interest rates and basically knocks any money that people would save because of this injustice gets knocked out of their hands anyway by landlords, 
you know, true. what did you really do? That's but, true. But I don't want to take that a defeatist attitude either. But yeah, I mean, you could always say that it, it would have been worse had you not done that. You know, would have been knocked back even further by by landlords or inflation or whatever. True. So, yeah, that's what I mean. So yeah, as as much as you're taking the boot off of people's necks, it, it at least frees them up a little bit to, you know, join the movement more. Actively. That's the argument, um, as yeah. well as um, in the meta game, to have the tools for people available to act politically, to mm. solve their economic problems with political solutions, since there's really no economic solution for them, for any of us. Um, the economic solution is get another job, start your own business, uh, yeah. sell yeah, out right. more of your time. Right. Political solution is unionizing, organizing in a party uh, that resists and, and does things and makes political demands with political consequences. And uh, but there needs to be tools to do that, and there really aren't a lot of tools. There are mainstay unions, so that's a tool. There's the IWW, you know, it's a toolbox. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to me, the Greens are not yet a tool for political, you know, action that everyone can just run to when they say, I have a problem, I'm going to go right. to Green Party. Um, people, even people, you have to be a freak just to think, I'm going to go to the Democratic Party because I have a problem. Or, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's for sure. But that is what a lot of community leaders, like, that is the way they think. Mm -hmm. so it's like, it's, it is a matter of replacing the Dems or the people you go to to ask for a favor uh, or to get a sidewalk fixed versus your local anarchist band or uh or the greens or for sure. socialists for sure so we have power would be replacing to be like mm -hmm. i have a problem that can't be fixed with you know the bank won't fix it for me right I to, yeah to, i need a political solution for this since i mean tools, people yeah. only think political when it's something that's a public service or a public community, like sure, sure. so if it's something that isn't state control already they don't even think of it as a political problem for or, sure or something that could have a political solution so that's also where you expand that. And that's where we would be different your democratic uh, party machine is this landlord thing. That's also a problem we can fix with politics or rent control and whatever comes out. Mm -hmm. Social mm -hmm. housing, which Democrats will never act on. Yeah. Not on their own. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we did get rent control passed in, in, uh, St. Paul, but that was a somehow it was a, a uh, voter referendum. So, yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. It, still, hey, just like Kansas, you get it on the ballot and you can win with a mm -hmm. with a you can do the get out the vote campaign because um, mm -hmm. it is something that people actually want, which isn't the same because it, when it isn't up or down on the issues, not say a candidate, not on the party, down, yeah. Or Absolutely. Bernie or Sanders, where yeah. even those that were really, really pro Bernie knew that should he win, it's not like we're going to accomplish anything on the national level policy wise. It was always of this just opens more space to do more building DSA work. Sure. Uh, for sure. We're building an actual left that mm -hmm. we will, we, us Bernie Kratz, will be able to have dual, dual power. Right. And this is something Matt Crispin was talking about where. You know, that the, all these people like him, podcasters and such, that knew, like, with a Sanders presidency, they would at least have, they would be raised to mainstream status. Right. And that would be a big forward step. That would be big, if, yeah. Even if it meant that we don't actually have any power, or we don't have the real power, and we're right. not going to pass single payer health care, um, and everything that Sanders administration's got to get blocked or something. But we will be raised up to mainstream level. But that was that was that was just as I mean I, I was I, I had no confidence in that, being a veteran occupy and having mm -hmm. a similar type of mindset mm -hmm. about, you know, the Occupy movement is making space for a left. I thought it was. It actually it wasn't. Um, no. I, well, I always revise my opinion. I know the last time we were speaking about it, when I was explaining consensus and stuff, that um, it, all these things come out of it. 
but they're all community projects and there has always been community projects or community organizing stuff. And sure. there was just a, all the people who are committed to Occupy had this idea that I myself included that it was still going and that by doing community projects that we were continuing Occupy, but it is a separate sure. thing. It is different. It's not the, a non, a non movement. Um, I see. I see. And similarly, all of the community <clears throat> projects we do should not be considered to be part of any grand political project um, in a way, unless it coalesces, unless it organize, gets organized into the socialist yeah. project, which yeah, yeah. is what happened. And I need to read the history on this, but it's just from the cover of a book about how in the last recession of the 19th century, uh, the 18 late 1880s and 90s, big recession, a lot of hard times. And you had all these cooperatives and all this cooperative economic stuff happening, as well as the labor movement growing, uh, but also getting beaten by being up by Pinkertons. Yeah. Um, but growing into uh, an actual socialist volley politic. Um, but you also had the populist party and the progressive party and these are all kind of separate things, strands, but they're all kind of, that's why we call it a progressive era because there was a lot of stuff happening, including a socialist movement. And it didn't really, it got kind of cut down by the yeah, 20s sure in the war. But mm -hmm. before the war, it was a real thing. Um, at least that's the view of some Marxists. Yeah. Because after the that's, war, that's it all becomes social democracy in a way. Yeah. Even Debs and stuff. And all so professional socialists. Or statists who are, you know, following Stalin and whatever the line is for Moscow, which became mm -hmm. a double-edged sword where it's like, well, we're part of an international movement. We should follow the line. And on the one hand, and on the other hand, when the line really fucks up, <laughs> you're kind yeah, of maybe it don't, anyway. that is in fact really antithetical to American values. You're not really able to build an American socialist movement, sure, um, at all, which is sort of what happened amongst all the state repression. But yeah, that's... you can't just blame it all because <laughs> if there was enough residents, there would be resistance, and there would have been enough. Uh, to survive. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, um, you close the. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's getting past my my bedtime. Oh yeah, actually, so now. it is. So, <laughs> uh, so okay. is there anything you want to to plug or anything you want to shout out or talk about? We'll see we if I actually around? do my show um, okay. next week. Uh, I will have soon. I'll make it up. I haven't made the date yet, but I will ha interview my socialist friend who's now the director of United Tenants, uh, Albany Tenants United, which is cool. um, not the Tenants Union, but it's the nonprofit that would do like t eviction defense and stuff. But he has, since a socialist is now the director, um, started union organize tenant organizing as one of its. Uh, projects so Very i'm cool. really excited to talk to him about that and get the lowdown and whatever because my show is now more of a local news show of like what's mm -hmm. going on let's talk to the activist on the ground How, what's going on tell us your story you know, <laughs> i'll practice my npr voice <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah yeah take some uh ira glass lessons <laughs> <laughs> he's got that voice he, he pulls you through the story though well yeah i guess at a time but i got tired of it okay thanks thanks for having me on gab and yeah thanks for coming on it was it was a nice surprise to to see you so uh, talk over the women that that that, that, to... that reader is a little the thespianism is a little distracting i kind of like it i it, it 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 hits right especially when he's doing like uh you know, some upper class twit sort of accent. I, I like that part. I, I can see how it can it could be anyone who writes. That's, that's the point of the people's history is to show <laughs> the writings that are not by Governor Warthrop and Tom Cotton. Tom yeah, Cotton, right. For sure. The original. Oh, God, Tom 
Cotton. I know that's a senator, yeah. but it's also the name of, yeah. Yeah, I wonder if there's any relation. That's interesting. Uh, you always wonder if there is. And there sort of yeah. is, but it's pretty distant. Similar to how the Bushes are related to the Pierces. Oh, for sure. And the Pierces go back to English aristocracy. Oh, I didn't know they went back that far. I knew about the they probably presidency. Don't, but that's I can't imagine. Oh, yeah. It's not probably like any too. of the early presidents were actually mountain men. Uh, working that's true. Them. That's true. Jeez, come on, man. <laughs> uh, even, um, uh, 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 you know, the first populist. Um, why can't Andrew I, Jackson. Yes, even Andrew Jackson not a not, did not star as a poor man. Yeah. He was a rich man who owned slaves and all the all the stuff, and he yeah. was he was protecting sure that persona interests. though. Yeah, yes. <laughs> persona comes from protecting his interests and doing it For sure. in, that, in a Trump like fashion. Well, cool. I look I look forward to your, your new episode. That sounds like a really cool interview, and uh, yeah, looking forward to Sunday as well. Mm -hmm. Some more memes. Yeah, once now the humanity is about to break, or at least the heat wave. Yeah. Um, I should have a more productive uh, August. All right. Very good. Well, thanks again, and, and have a great rest of your night, Dan. See you Sunday. All right. Well, that was part one of People's History of the United States, Chapter 6. So we will be continuing on next Monday at around the same time. I, I got a little bit of a late start tonight, but... Uh, I was just hoping that people would pop into the, the uh, chat, and, and eventually someone did. But, man, I would have been waiting uh, quite, quite a bit longer if I was waiting for, uh, for that. Um, but anyway, I want to shout out one more time the, the GoFundMe by my good friend, Freddie Eddie, who is in need of a little bit of help. You know, it's one of those things, but I, I found myself in the same sort of position where if not for my parents or help from friends, I myself could have been homeless many times over. So it's uh, something that, that pretty much all Americans face. But if you, can, if you can afford to donate, if things are going well for you right now and you can afford to give even a few dollars, it would mean a lot to me. Um, it looks like we don't have anyone in the, the Twitch right now, so we're not going to raid. Um, let's see. We'll just shout someone out on Twitch, though. Let's see who's on right now. Looks like Epic Prawn. Always good. Oh, poor Pearl's Almoner. Yeah. We will shout out poor Pearl's Almanac, so you should all check them out. In fact, we're probably going to raid just so we can make sure to host them after this channel. Yeah, it goes off the air. So we will do that. But everyone should check out Poor Pearl's Almanac. Really great member of Left Signal Boost TV. Uh, what is it they're talking about tonight? Oh, are they done? Actually, I think they may have just ended. I think they may have just ended. Yeah, looks like they are. Oh, fair. They must have just ended their show right now. Oh, they're actually hosting me. So. <laughs> All right. We'll find someone else then to shout out who... Oh, I don't want to do modern day debates because they're doing an atheism one and those always end up being really just yelling festivals. All right, so instead we'll shout out Radical Leftist Agenda. I'm not as familiar with their stuff, but uh, looks like a pretty good show right now. Let's see what they're doing right now. They're talking about, oh, stories. Uh, so I'm not quite sure. Looks like they got a panel discussion going, perhaps. Anyway, go check them out. And, uh... I'm going to be, my wife and I are going to be looking at houses again this Wednesday. So, 
we will not be uh, doing our, our normal Wednesday stream. So you have to look for me. And I'm probably not going to do a Friday stream either. It's going to be a while before I'm going to be back to doing the Friday video game stream. So it's probably not going to be till Sunday again that I'll, I'll be able to see you all. But in the meantime, um, get your monkeypox vaccine if you can. Um, even if you don't think you're at high risk, uh, unless doing so takes away from people that would be at higher risk. My suggestion is if it's available to you, go out and get it. Because we don't want a repeat of COVID. We don't want this to just be spreading unchecked. Especially at this time when people are fatigued from COVID still. And still not taking it very seriously. Even though they should be. Even though people keep dying. Uh, anyway. Protect yourselves and each other.